OK, great. So now myself and Anna are going to talk you through a little bit about what's coming up in the next year. And I guess I wanted to start, I mean, we keep hearing about evolving, don't we? Michael was just talking about constantly evolving your behaviour. And we're constantly evolving the way that we're delivering the programme as well. So Amar talked you through the driver diagram earlier on. And we're constantly updating that based on new feedback. And a good example of that was our recent uh, uh, mixed method evaluation for the first year of the programme that we did in the summer last year. And a lot of the stuff that's came out of that we've fed back into the programme. So from our perspective, we think there are five key areas that we need to focus on in the next year. Uh, one area would be embedding QI into directorates. Another is thinking about making QI work itself easier. Thinking about scale up and spread. We've heard it already, increasing service user and care involvement and linking quality and cost. So talk you through the first two, here's Emma. So we want to move away from quality improvement being just a, a separate activity that exists with those that are keen to it becoming the way that we tackle our complex problems, for it to really be part of the culture and the way that we work. And so to do that needs a lot of effort and attention. And we're really going to spend a lot of time in the next year or two thinking about how to make this the way that we operate. And that needs thinking at lots of levels, but mainly, mainly about leadership behaviours really here. The first thing is really thinking about how we can make sure that from the most senior level at the board to any single team in the organisation, across all 300 teams, there's a sense of alignment. So people know how their work fits into the big picture of where the organisation is heading. That is almost non-existent in the health service because there's such complexity. Each team is working usually on about 20 or 30 things. Whereas we need to get better at saying, here's the two things we want to focus on for the next year. The two most important, most complex things that we're going to spend some of our energy on using QI to, to help tackle. So helping us to figure out what our improvement priorities are and aligning those from top to bottom and bottom to top is really key. We talked earlier this morning about coaching, and I think that's another key, key part of embedding this within directorates. Local people who understand the local system, credible leaders in that area, who have some time and space and skills to be able to help teams tackle the things they really need to tackle. And then we need to do things around system redesign, changing the way we recruit people, changing the way we appraise performance, changing the way we develop and nurture leaders to help make sure that becomes part of the culture of the organisation. We equally need to spend time on making this work easier. Right? Nobody has time to spend messing about trying to do the nitty gritty work of data or collecting PDSAs. We need to make that stuff as easy as possible so people can spend their time making the changes they need to make. And again, that doesn't really exist in the health system. There is no real structural system to make this easy. The first thing we started doing is making data transparent and accessible. Okay, we collect tons of data in the health service. We do very little with it, and we make almost none of it transparent to our staff. If you can't see how you're doing, how can you ever hope to improve? So six months ago, we, we made all of our quality and safety data accessible to everyone as time series analysis. It doesn't really exist in most places in the UK, but this is a really key first step for us. It's only a first step, but it's a first step to giving people the data they need to be able to improve. Coming next, we're going to bring onto that same platform violence dashboards, access dashboards, so people can automatically get the data they need in control charts if they're working on those topics. Again, making stuff easier for people. The next thing we're going to do is move towards all of our contract performance indicators being viewed as time series analysis. Again, most teams, people working teams, have no idea how they're doing on their contract performance. Again, if you don't know, how can you improve? <laughs> so we're going to try and start making that more accessible, and again, critically, as time series analysis, so you can understand variation over time. We've also spent the last three months trying to design a new web platform for this work, a single place where all of this QI work can happen. So this will allow people to be able to drag and drop things into driver diagrams and to mess about with it much more easily than they can at the moment. It'll allow you to pick change ideas and attach them to secondary drivers. It'll allow you to document your PDSAs really simply in web forms. And the best bit is it'll do your data for you. And everyone knows that data is the hardest bit of quality improvement. So you can create your measures, you can put your data in, and it will create your charts for you. No more messing around with Excel, unless you really want to. <laughs> so 
it'll hopefully make everything accessible in a single online place where everyone does their work and can access the whole repository of work across the trust. And it will have real-time analytics so people can see how things are going across the directorate, across the whole trust. And that will be coming soon in the next few weeks. So let's now talk about scale up and spread. We have now got 31 teams like these who are seeing sustainable improvement of the order that they can start to think about scaling up their work and spreading in the organisation. I think that's absolutely fantastic. 31 projects. And you heard Bob Lloyd talking earlier on about structure and process and stuff like that, but we're trying to take a leaf out of that book as well. By putting in place structures and processes and a culture, we're hoping we'll get the outcome, which in this case is spreading that work. Because think about it. QI isn't just about having one pocket of excellence or one great project. It's about spreading that throughout the organisation, isn't it? So everybody can share. So we've put in place effectively a four-step process to help support that work. So the first one we've got is a system for identifying projects that are starting to see results. So there will be many QI leads here, there will be many uh, project leads and people like that, and you are able to see uh, project scores, how you're doing, and this gives us a system, an early warning system to say, look, this team is starting to do really well, how do we think about taking that to the next level? The second thing we've done is built a process to help people really think about what they need to do to scale up their work and spread it. So on the QI microsite, which is freely available, we've got a lot of information there, almost figuring out what's the difference between scale up and spread, and what are the key questions you really need to ask before you start to do that work. The third thing is that we don't want to just um, commit one of the seven spreadly sins, which is just give one team has done very well, haven't they? Let's get them to do everything. They'll do that throughout the entire organisation. This is not about that. So it's being mature enough to say, if we want to spread this elsewhere, who would be the right people to help support that work, to give it the best chance of opportunity? And finally, we love QI methodology, don't we? So we continue to use QI methodology. We continue to use data over time. And even when we're implementing, we continue to use PGSA cycles to allow us to do that. A great example of this is the violence reduction work that's been going on in Tower Hamlets. So if we start at um, one of the areas of Genesis, which was Globoard, back many, many years ago, they saw some amazing results, absolutely amazing results by testing some things out. So this is one ward. And you can see, actually, if you look at the median, they've seen an 87% reduction in violence for many years now. Isn't that fantastic? And we've got some of the Globe War team here as well. It's absolutely fantastic. And now, thinking about, right, so we've got this thing that we know works really well. How do we, spread, how do we scale that up? So we then scaled it up in a very careful fashion to the whole of the Tower Hamlet Centre Mental Health. So all four acute wards and the two pickies as well. And look at this, some quite cool results. They are seeing, um, overall, a 50% reduction in violence now. Once again, not for one month, not for two months, for you know, at least a year, okay? So that's really, really great. But now, that takes us on to our next conundrum. How do we support this work to go even wider? How do we take it from Tower Hamlets and spread it throughout the organisation? And we're doing that now. We're spreading it to Newham, and we're spreading it to, um, also to um, City and Hackney. So that's where we are now. But by using this process to make sure that the ch you know, this project's got the best chance to sort of spread is really, really important, as we just spoke through. The second thing we're going to talk about here is increasing service user care or customer involvement. So you've heard us talk about this lots and lots and lots. We now have a service user um, and carer QI steering group made up of service users, carers, PPLs and the QI team as well, and we are really going for this. So this is our driver diagram. We've got a very, very comprehensive strategy because this is not a simple issue. And some things that you'll be seeing coming up will be based on whether we're looking for little, envi little eye involvements. Remember, little eye is when we're involving service users throughout the course of the project on a periodic basis, whereas big eye is where they're an equal member of the team. So let's look at some of the cool things that are going to be coming up in the next year. On little eye, Think of the thousands of patients that we have coming through our services you know, um, year by year. Think of the thousands of people, their, their voices, their experience. We need to try to capture that better. So we're now going to give teams the opportunity to add questions related to QI work that they're doing 
onto their electronic uh, patient experience feedback systems. So whether that's the iPad that sits in the CMHT where service users can say how they're feeling or the iPads that we're using um, in wards. So we're going to be adding that for teams. So you can say, for example, you want to improve the quality of food. You can have questions about what's the quality of food and get real-time feedback sent back to you as a QI team as you're, if you're working on that. And the other big area is we're really working hard to make sure that as many service users as possible are able to be involved in Big Eye. So we've now uh, got QI on the uh, Recovery College syllabus, but not just information about QI, but the whole set of skills that will help service users better do that. So confidence, being able to talk in big groups, it all fits in. And we're also working very, very closely with OT to help create more opportunities to get service users and carers involved. Anna. So the, the final of our five areas of focus is about linking quality and cost. If we're really going to be using QI to tackle our complex challenges, this has to be an area of focus. Um, and so when you think about the return on investment from this work, it's a question we often get asked. The most important return on investment is this one here about improving service user and carer outcomes. That is the most important reason for doing this work. There are also other reasons for doing this work and other returns you get from it. You'll already have seen from some of the posters and some of the table presentations how teams are getting more efficient, more productive, and more effective about the way they work through this method. There'll also be lots of intangible, intangible benefits from doing this. So things around staff experience of working in this organization, about our organizational reputation, about generating revenue as an organization to help our sustainability for the longer term. Those are intangible benefits from QI. But there are a small number of areas where you can see direct cash that could come out from quality improvement. And in any balanced portfolio of quality improvement, you would have a small number of your projects tackling this area. So here's four examples for you. First of all, you'll have heard probably about the violence reduction work we did in older adult wards. And our finance team has done a cost model on this to understand what are the direct costs related to violence during, the, during this work. So you've got here before costs, which are about 120,000, during the project costs and after the project costs. And these are costs directly attributable to violence. So you can see already direct cash savings from this work. The second project here around pressure ulcer reduction, one of our big areas of work. And our finance team have modelled the pay costs and non-pay costs of managing grade twos, grade threes, and grade fours. And that is for our system. Those are, these are based on local costs that we incur. So we can see now that if we are to prevent a certain number of pressure ulcers, what will be the cost that we save from doing that? This team here in Newham, an older adult ward, has managed to reduce bed occupancy from a pretty stable figure of 80, 85 to 88% down to around 50 to 60%. And that's been sustained now for many months. So if we, if we can scale that up to the other single ward in Tower Hamlets and Hackney, we could see potential for, again, removing cash from this system to help us become more efficient and effective as a service. And last example here is the disciplinary process, which the HR team has been leading on and which won the poster competition today. It's a fantastic project. They, they are looking at reducing the time from starting the disciplinary process to ending. And our finance team have modeled the costs of that process. So you can see here the data for the 2014 2014-15 costs of suspensions related to this process. And the team have already managed to reduce the average length of time from over 100 days to around 50 days. And if they can sustain that for a year, that would equate to savings of nearly half a million a year, direct cost savings. So there are lots of places where we're going to be starting to link quality and cost together and doing it in a sensible way. The final point we wanted to mention as a, as a closing remark is just about how much impact this is having, not just here in East London and in Bedfordshire and Luton, but beyond that. The application of quality improvement in mental health services and community services has not really been tested before. There's very few places doing this work around the world. So there's lots of interest on how we're doing this, on the changes we're testing, and the outcomes we're receiving. And we thought we'd finish with three messages from people from across the globe who have heard about the work, been here to visit, or heard about it in some other way, and what inspiration they've taken from it. Hello, 
my name is David Grayson. I'm clinical lead for patient safety patient experience here at Wairamata DHB in Auckland, New Zealand. And I'm wishing you well there at the East London Foundation Trust for your conference, which is coming up in March. Uh, we greatly admire the work that you're doing and hugely impressed by the awards you won for the uh, Nursing Times Award as well as the Patient Safety Awards there in the NHS. We think you're doing a fantastic job. Keep it up and have a great conference and we look forward to keeping in touch. Cheers. My name is Abhishek Bhartia and I'm the director of a non-profit hospital in Delhi. I had the chance of visiting East London in January 2015. I was impressed by the systematic manner in which East London has built the will and the capability for quality improvement and the momentum that it has generated with a portfolio of quality improvement projects. But what struck me even more was the willingness of leaders to share their learning and their humility. We are only just getting started, is what I heard Amar Shah and others say, but I left believing that East London had become an inspiring example for healthy institutions around the world. Hello and greetings from the Institute of Mental Health Singapore. I'm Hong Chun, the CEO of IMH, and I had the wonderful privilege of visiting the East London Foundation Trust and seeing for myself the wonderful work that you are doing with your service users. I visited quite a few of your centres and ended the day with a wonderful party with service users and staff alike. I congratulate you on your QI conference and for two years of wonderful work at improving the quality and safety of, the care of, of your services. I hope that you will have the opportunity to visit us in Singapore one of these days and I believe that the Institute of Mental Health Singapore and East London Foundation Trust can work collaboratively and in partnership to improve, to further improve the lives of the service users and the caregivers that we look after.